Now we are going to see uh, a real protocol. This real protocol is HDLC. So what we want to do is to optimize this protocol send and wait. Send and wait works bad because in fact here we wait B after each acknowledgement. So what we are going to develop is a notion of anticipation. It means that here, if I send another frame here, I will use the bandwidth, even if I don't receive the acknowledgement. Then, if I send another frame here, even if I don't receive the acknowledgement, I will optimize the use of a bandwidth. If I send another frame here, I will also use more bandwidth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if I send another frame here, in fact, I am using continuously the bandwidth even if I don't receive any acknowledgement. So for example, here is what we call last time timin. And here, I have a time that I will call, it's here, it's t from trip time. So wrong trip time is a time for a bit to go from our, you send the first bit here of the packet and you receive the last bit of the acknowledgement. So if you divide t wrong trip time by t min, you take the uh, highest value, uh, integer value, then here you have the number of frames you have to, minimal number of frames you have to send, and if you use this minimum number of frames, you are continuously sending information. Because here, for example, I do an anticipation of one, two, three, four, five. But during the fifth frame, I receive the acknowledgement of the first one. And if it's correct, then I can continue. So here, in that case, with an anticipation of five frames, or PDU, I can send continuously the information. So that's a good thing because we saw that it was the main drawback of send and wait, is that send and wait was sending only, uh, was waiting a lot of time before sending another frame. Of course, if I take the value of the previous example, where we, uh, we had something like three, uh, zero, zero dot 0.3 seconds for round trip time, is something close to, I don't remember, but it was the order of 10 minus 6. It means that in the previous example, you have to anticipate a lot to send a continuous flow of information. So maybe it's not that good, because you may have some errors. And here, of course, we suppose that we have no error. Because here, for example, if I receive, I, there is a propagation error on the first frame, I will not detect it. I will just detect it, so for example here, because when I receive the green frame, they will, I will have an error message and say, no, sorry, send me one because I received two, but I have not received one. So you see, we are here at the sending the frame number six, and we detect a problem on frame number one. That means that it will be more complex to recover, recover errors than in uh, send and wait because we have to memorize more information and we have to resend this, uh, this kind of information. In that case, will I send the whole five frames again or only the one? It depends. So in HDLC, you have two behaviors. One is to resend all after the failure. So here, for example, I detect an error. So I will send again one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so it's no, normally what you do. 
when you use this kind of protocol. But the other possibility is just to send the frame, the last frame, and then continue sending the other. In one way, you optimize your bandwidth, but you disorder the information. So we are going to see uh, that in more detail when we study the, the protocol. So it, you, both behavior are, are possible. The, the second point is, and it will help, help us to understand how we have developed the, the frame format. You remember, when we talk about the PDU format of our cell and weight protocol, what did we do? We use one byte for either and two bytes for CRC. Okay? And in the either, what did we have? We have one bit that tell, told you if it was data or acknowledgement, and one bit that told you if it was zero, counter, or one. And here you see it was just for one way. So in our example, we focus only on transmission from one point to another. But we didn't care about the other place. So what if we had in the same way protocol, if we had transmission, bidirectional transmission, what we have done is to send the frame here, and then to send an acknowledgement. And in the other way, we will have send a frame, and then we will have received an acknowledgement. So this is a possibility to have two mechanisms, one for data and one for acknowledgement. But here you see that I am losing a lot of bits here. They were reserved. So you propose to use one for the end bit, okay? But we re it remains a lot of bits. So for example, here, you see that I am, uh, if I send another information here, or let's say here, maybe I can carry also in my information frame some, con some value to acknowledge what I have received. So this way, maybe I can avoid to send the acknowledgement and carry the bit, the acknowledgement bit, inside the iframe, the information frame. So this is one, uh, one possibility also. It's to carry acknowledgement on all frames. So to say here is the counter for data I'm sending counter for data here, and another counter, counter here for acknowledgement. And this way, I can optimize also the transmission. If I have bidirectional flows, I don't have to send acknowledgement frame. I can use my information frame to acknowledge the information. So here, in fact, you see that we have two counters. And these counters here are only on one bit, because it was a send and wait. I'm sending and I am waiting for the acknowledgement. Here, in that case, the counter has to be larger because I am not sending and waiting, but I am sending all the time. So I have also to increase the size of the count. How does the first size, the first part, uh, receive the acknowledgement on the same frame it's, it's being sent? So if you receive twice the acknowledgement, you don't care. So acknowledgement have a special behavior. For example, I'm so for example, I'm sending a frame here. I receive an information frame with value zero and acknowledgement zero. And here I receive I received before an acknowledgement for zero. So it's just the same, it's the same information. So I don't care. Now, for example, I receive acknowledgement zero and acknowledgement three. What does it mean? 
It means that here, if I receive acknowledgement for three, it means that the over doesn't uh, scream because he has a problem. Maybe he has sent acknowledgement one and acknowledgement two. And here, I lost, I have lost one and two. It was a transmission error. But that's not a problem. Because when I receive three, it means that I'm acknowledging everything until three. So here, acknowledgements are cumulative. So you don't have to be reliable on your acknowledgement. If you lose acknowledgement, it doesn't matter because maybe you will have another one. Of course, if you are losing all, then you will have a problem and you will need a timer to resend them. But it's not so bad when you lose a specific acknowledgement. Of course, if you use an iframe with an acknowledgement, then uh, you, you have to resend the iframe because the uh, information frame contains data. But acknowledgement by themselves doesn't contain data, and so you don't care. On some, in some case, for example, some protocol or some tools, equipment in your network, will reduce the number of uh, acknowledgement. And if you have an equipment and this, uh, this device has several acknowledgement, ACK0, ACK1, ACK2, and ACK3, and the bandwidth is limited on the other side, so you can make an optimization and reduce your transmission queue by just sending ACK3. So here on acknowledgement, you can do more things than with data, because they don't care. A specific acknowledgement frame, or PDU, doesn't carry any data. So the, 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 the part that sends acknowledgement will not send acknowledgements of data, for instance, will not send acknowledgement three if he didn't receive correctly one, two, and zero, right? Yes, he will say, I'm, I'm expecting zero. So if, for example, if you receive one, two, and zero, then when he will receive two, he will send something and say, I am expecting one. So I want one, I want one. So for example, you're sending zero, you, use one, you lose one, then you have two, three, four, etc., five, six, <laughs> So we are in the anticipation phase, so you send all the buffer, and this one is lost. So here, you may have, after a timer, maybe act zero. Okay? You see that, in fact, we will not say zero, but we will put one. We'll put the number of the frame we expect. So if I have received zero, then I'm expecting one. So here, I don't receive one, I receive two, and here I put ACK1, or NAC. Well, we can do both. Let's say ACK. Let's be totally optimistic. So I say ACK1. Here I receive three, I say ACK1. Here I receive four, five, uh, four. I say ACK1. So here, the sender will receive the missing one. Three, three times, four times, act one. Okay? But act one doesn't mean that I've received one, but I am expecting one. So act one just say that I have received zero. And received two and three and No. I just say that I have received zero. So it means that here, I will have some time, a timer, that will start for uh, PDU 1. And after that long timer delay, I will send again from 1. And we you know, will don't care for the top 1. So this is not optimal. Because here, maybe I have an anticipation window. I can send up to 6 frame without acknowledgement. So here we'll have a big silence on my list. A long silence on my list. So that's not a, a good situation. 
So for example, in TCP, this is not the same value. But in TCP, when you receive three times what we call duplicate act, so it is duplicated for this one. So I have three duplicate acts. So a positive acknowledgement becomes a negative acknowledgement for one. And here, I will send again one. So this way, I detect just by receiving something that says it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Then it's so good that it becomes suspicious. And you say, if it's good until there, it means that I continue to do things, but it says it's good, it's good, but I have no trust of uh, evolution. So I say, okay, he has lost his frame, so I reset it. Of course, if I have a big disequence thing of my data and one arrived here, I will have resend it for nothing. But normally, it's not the case. It's one optimization you, you will find in, uh, in TCP to avoid to start on a timer that is very long uh, at the beginning. So this is one possibility. In what we are going to see, HDLC, we are not telling here that we acknowledge. But in fact, here we say we reject. I reject this frame because it's out of sequence and I am expecting one. So normally here when you see the rejects, it means that here you will send one. So it will be faster. In TCP you don't have negative acknowledgement. You just have positive acknowledgement. In HDLC we will see that we, we can do negative acknowledgement. Okay, so HDLC is a very, very old protocol. So uh, from the beginning of computer science, you see version of HDLC designed by IBM for their uh, mainframe. And it becomes standardized under this name, high-level data link control, HDLC. Of course, and was very, very used in a network protocol called X25. So X25 was the first, one of the first French data network that was used, for example, by the Minitel. So who knows about Minitel here? With, with, who knows and is not French? Okay, so Minitel was one first uh, terminal developed by France Telecom before the internet. And it was using the X25 infrastructure. So if you want to see what is a Minitel, you have to do it quickly because next, next year France Telecom will stop the, the service. So it means that it was, um, so they use a, uh, HDLC, but nowadays, of course, we don't see any more HDLC because nobody you really use X25 or in some very specific case. But this protocol, continue to be used in different cases. For example, when you, s you are sending an SMS on your mobile phone, you use a version of uh, HDLC, which is called FDM, M for mobile. In the internet, if you were using a modem to connect to the internet, you will have used PPP. When you so PPP is a version of uh, ITF, so IDF likes to change the name, so we call it PPP, point-to-point -point protocol. When you are doing a DSL connection, so, from your, so most of the time you have PPP on it. In the core network, when you are using optical fiber, you may have also PPP. So each time you have something that is point-to-point, -point, usually you have PPP, and PPP is something that is derived from HDLC on a lot, with a lot of simplification. But we are going to, to see uh, how it works, to see uh, so some protocol. And there is two ways to make it work. We have one way which is connection oriented. So it means that we are going to open a connection. So tell the other guy, I'm ready to talk with you. 
and then send data and then close the connection. So this is one possibility. And the other mode, not of uh, lab B, but uh, that you can find, for example, in PVP, is what we call datagram. So we just send data and you expect that the other end will receive it. And if there is error, the frame is discarded and there is no notification. So upper layer will have to detect. But it's much more simpler and the internet normally we use a datagram box. So we will see this, uh, this kind of thing. But today, or uh, right now, we are going to focus on uh, lab, lab, lab B. And lab B is connection oriented. <coughs> so lab B is connection oriented and is asynchronous. It means that you can send when you want information on the link. So remember the problem we have between physical layer and data link layer is that at the physical layer we have a flow of information. So when, since you have a flow of information and we want to work on PDU and PDU is a limited uh, block of information so we have to cut the information, the flow of information into blocks to create a PDU. So it's a problem you have when you go to Carrefour and you want, you put all your goods in, a, I say a trailer, when you put all, all your things and you want to separate what you have by from the other people's uh, things. So how you do that? How do you separate your goods from the other? So you have a bar that say next customer. So there is one big convention in your supermarket is that you cannot buy this bar. Because if you can buy this bar, it means that the cashier cannot make the difference between what you buy and the separation. So this is one possibility. The other possibility is, for example, to, lay, to leave a lot of room between your food and the other people's stuff. So this is another possibility. But here, what we are going to do is to avoid this next customer sign to be on the PDU. So here, of course, we have another next customer sign, etc. And you can separate. So we can do that. There is two possibilities. One possibility we saw uh, when we study layer one protocol is, for example, to use a coding like 4B, 5B. Remember, I have. I want to send four bits of information, and I am using five bits of information to send these four bits. So it means that I have 16 values that are used for binary data, and 16 values that are non-binary data. So it's like, it's like the next customer sign. It means that here I can use non-binary symbol, to separate my PDUs. And this way, I am sure that I will never find these values inside the PDU. But it means that for each bit or each four bit I am sending, I am losing one bit. So it's not really a loss in some cases because it's a way to allow clock synchronization. But in fact, on very low speed links, maybe it's not the best solution. An HDLC, as I say, was developed a long time ago. And at this time, we didn't have a very high speed, uh, high speed links. So they, they developed another way to avoid this next, next customer sign to be on the phone. So first, what is the next customer side sign? In HDLC, it's a symbol 
zero, one, 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 zero. And here, zero, one, 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 zero. So this is called a flag. And the flag is used to separate PDUs inside the uh, uh, during the transmission. So the, the big difference between the supermarket example and the telecommunication world it means that when you have nothing to do, you just send flag. Like, so zero one 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 zero zero one 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 zero zero one 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 zero etc. So it means that in the Carrefour supermarket, when the lady has, uh, has nothing to do, she wish normally she will put next customer sign just to make uh, the trailer go around. So, of course, in Carrefour it's stupid, but in telecommunication we we don't care. If you have if we have nothing to, to send, it's better to send this because this allows the receiver clock to be always synchronized with the sender clock. So when you have something to send, no problem, you can send it directly because you know that the receiver is synchronized. So here, I have this. But of course, some people may, may find funny, for example, to say, okay, in my PDU, I will you. I, I want to send this, and it's my right. Protocol has to be totally transparent, and that can send any kind of information on my link, so I can send that. So how can I solve this problem? So the rule, we have a stupid rule that says that when you find this thing on the wire, then after five bits equal to one, you add a zero. Every time, you don't ask any question. If the uh, next bit is equal to one or zero, no. After five bits equal to one, you add a zero. And when you receive five bits equal to one, if there is a, a zero after, then the receiver will suppress it. So this way you avoid to find this sequence of data or in the PDU. So if it appears, it's only to separate frame. Okay? So let's see an example. We have this, you receive this block of information for the first one. What the question is, where do we have flag? Yeah, I receive this information. So here what I have to do is I have to look at sequence of the flag. So one uh, zero one 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 zero. So here, I see three times this sequence. So it means that in the middle, this is one PDU. So you have the blue PDU here, and here you have the green PDU. OK? So this flag separates PDU. It means that when it's not the beginning and the end, it's just a separation. So when I have two closed PDU, I will have just one flag between them. If I have two PDU with a certain distance time between them, then I will have a lot of flags in the middle. But the minimum number is here. So now, what will be, uh, what I will say, I received that from <coughs> my upper layer. So here, what I will send, so each time I have five bit equal to one, I add a zero. On this, this way, I have no confusion, I will find nowhere something that look 
like the flag inside the data. And for v over 1, sorry, for v over 1, it means that here I have a flag. Here I have a flag. And in the middle, it's time I see 5 bits equal to 1. If I have a 0, then I suppress v0. And here I receive 5, 5 bits equal to 1. <coughs> but after that, I have 1, 0. So I understood it as a flag. So this is used by HDLC. And if you remember what I told you about computers, we don't like that much this. Because adding a bit in the middle of a sequence is something that could be very expensive. <coughs> so for example, when you are using your uh, computer to do a PPP, uh, PPP connection with another computer, you are not using going to use that. In fact, what you are going to send is character or 8, eight bits of information. So you will have, for example, here your flag can be viewed as 3E in hexadecimal. And so you are going to send then, for example, information, and here you have 3E that appears. So in that case, what you will do is to send another character, what we call an escape character, and a value to say that, in fact, this escape character and value should be viewed as 3E. So this way you avoid to send this. So normally you have an escape character. So what you have to say is that, for example, escape, escape mean escape. So this way when you have to send, so you have to, two coding to do. One is for the flag you want to avoid. And since you start an escape here, if you add to set escape, then you repeat. So what is the main difference? It's here I am working in character and not bit. So if I am using the bit uh, sequence, sending bit per bit, and I have to send the value, for example, 53E1. So if I was using bit per bit, here I will detect a flag, and so I will have to add one bit after the fifth bit. <laughs> if I am in ASCII or 8 bit or on bytes, let's say, if I am on bytes, here I don't see 3F because I see 53 and then E1, so there is no confusion. Okay? So the flag doesn't appear or the escape character doesn't appear everywhere. Here it just appears because we are going bit by bit. Here it does not appear because we are character by character. So the advantage of that is that we never break the alignment in computer memory, which does use character. So we don't have to do shifts to continue to process the information. So that's something that is better handled in computer. So when you are doing PPP, you are most of the time in this situation. OK. So what we do when we have nothing to do, then we just send flag continuously to synchronize the receiver, the receiver key. OK. So now uh, we are going to see the frame format of these uh, HDLC PDU. So now, ju just one word about vocabulary. I should continue to use PDU, SDU, and SAP, and all this uh, vocabulary you have on OSI. And I will try to do it because you have to put that in your, in your mind. But normally, when we are at layer one, and we talk about a physical PDU, we talk about a bit, even if some people we talk about a symbol, but us as computer scientists, we talk about a bit. 
If we are at layer 2, a data link PDU, I will say a frame. And when I, I am at layer 3, a network PDU, I will call it a pattern. And after that, any other layer of PDU, I will call it a message. Okay? So normally, if I don't make any mistake, and sometimes I make some mistakes, when I say a frame, mean a layer 2 PDU. And when I say packet, it's I am at layers. But so let's look at now data link PDU. So what we saw before is that we we have some flag that separate each PDU. And the last two bit two bytes of the PDU e are the CRC. So we have a well-known CRC for HDLC and we send it on the last two bytes. Now if we look at the beginning, the first byte is an address. So address is not very useful in the case we study because we are on point to point link. But in some case it could be uh, useful, we are going to see why. And we have a control field, and the control field will carry the, t the type of PDU we have. And regarding the type, we may have or not data. And if we have data, for example, it will be either in the information, it will be in the information frame on what we see here, and I will talk about. This is connection-oriented frames. And I told you about datagram. So in some case, you can also send information using a datagram. So here is a frame. So what we, we have to study, so yes, I, I wanted to talk about addresses. And I told you that address are not very useful in, this, in the mode we want to study right now, because we are using a balance mode. What means a balance mode? It means that everybody is equal. There is no master, there is no slave. Okay? But when the protocol was designed, they use a mode that is called master and slave, and it means that you have one equipment, one piece of equipment, one device, that manage the communication. And it's called the master. And only the master can talk at the beginning. And you have slaves that are connected on the same wire. So for example, here you have a wire. And when the master talks, all the slaves receive information. If the two slaves or two pieces of equipment talk at the same time, then we have something that we cannot understand on the wire. So every device has to talk each one after the other, the other. So in that case, we have the master, and the master can send an information on the link and say, so we number our slave, and the master can send a message to slave one, do you have something to say? And slave one can say, no, I have nothing to say. Then the master will call step two, do you have something to say? And step two maybe will send information and say, okay, I finished. Then the master will call step three, do you have something to say? No, etc., etc. And periodically, the master will uh, probe all the devices to know if they have messages. So this is something that is not used in HDLC but you may find in some protocols. So we will do an exercise to understand how uh, ISDN network works, and here we will find this mode. In fact, we can also have some way, for example, a slave can try to send a short message to the master and say, I want to talk. And if the mes message is uh, shorter enough, 
then the risk to have two slaves that talk at the same time is very, very limited. So you inform the master that you want to talk, and the master then will, okay, now you want to talk, tell me what you want to say. So this is other possibility. And for example, when you are sending an SMS or opening a, a connection on your mobile phone, you use this kind of mode. It means that you send quickly a message to the master, so to your provider network, and say, I want to send an SMS. And then the master will allocate you resources to, to send this SMS. And here you have communication only with one master. So the advantage of this kind of uh, mode is that you don't have to configure that much the slaves. Because it's a master that knows everything. So for example, another example, you are connected right now on Wi-Fi. So normally, you have your master here. So this is the access point. And it will manage. And it will, when you will, if you want to send information to another guy in this room, then you will send your information to the master, and the master will send it to the other guy. So it's, so it's, some, uh, so it's something that is not so specific to the old time, and we can find in current protocol. But in HGLC, we don't have this. So here you see that we need address. I need, in fact, one address. The master needs one address, and the address is a destination address, to say to which slave he wants to talk. And when a slave talks, he has to put an address. This way, the master knows that who have talked. So when the master sends information, since the only one that can send information to the slave is the master, we don't need this address. But we need to know where it goes. And when the master receives information, he knows that the only one that can receive information is the master. And so he has to know where it comes from. So we need one address. But in the mod we are going to study, it's what we call the balance mod. And in the balance mod, address are not so important because when you send information, you know that it goes at the other end of the wire. And when you receive information, it knows, you know that it comes from the other end of the wire. So here, address is not something very important. So for example, if you look at PPP, so the specification of HDLC by IETF for IP, you have a way to compress the header size and to remove the address field because we don't use it. But it's here for compatibility reason with over mode uh, of HDLC. So, here I will not talk anymore of addresses. What is important to, to see is the control field because it gives you the nature as a friend. And we have three type of frame, what we call the iframe. Iframe is information frame. And iframe is the one in this example that can carry that can carry data. The other frame here that are listed here doesn't carry any data. So the only one that you can use to send data from one point to another in that situation is to use iframe. So, how you recognize an iframe? Because the first bit is equal to zero. So here we give the nature of a frame. And then, we will put two counters. Like in the send and wait protocol I talked just before, we will have, we will have a counter that we call NS, that will be the sequence number And we will have another counter, NR, which will be a kind of acknowledgement, and it will be the expected <coughs> K 
sequence number I, I want to receive from the other one. So we will keep on all the frames this, for example, in S frame I have NR, so it will be the same definition. So here I have this, and here I have a bit that will look what's the meaning of this bit. It's called PF. So pull and final. And we'll see the meaning of this bit. So one is zero, uh, yeah, sorry. It depends in the sequence. When it's put to one, it's either P or F. And when it's zero, we don't set it. We're going to see uh, why we need that. So here, you see, this is the frame for data. And this counter, NS, is used because each time I send a new data frame, I have to increase this, con uh, this counter number. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then 0, because it's on 3 bits. So we, after 7, we go back to 0. So here, as I said, it's when I'm sending data, I do what we call piggybacking. It means that we send also acknowledgement of what we have received. So when I'm sending data, I also acknowledge the sequence I have received. So that way, I, may don't, I don't have to use some specific frames to acknowledge the information. But sometimes I have no data to send, or I have a problem, and I have to inform the other one that I have well received the information, or I have a problem, and we have to repair this problem. So in that case, I will use, so what here we have information frame. So I will use what I call supervision frame. And supervision frame, how I can recognize them? They don't start here by a zero, but they start with a one. And then I will put a zero to say that it's supervision. So I have another sequence. When I see one zero, it's supervision frame. And for example, they are for acknowledgement. So I can copy here the same counter, NR, to get the information. To to tell which frame I am expecting. And here I have one bit, PF, we will see what it means. And it means that here I have two bits that remains. And on these two bits, I will call three or four frames. So for example, when I have zero, zero here, it's what we call receiver ready. So what does it mean receiver ready? It means that everything goes right. I have no problem. So the life is good. I have no problem. Things are fine. And I am expecting this value. So you can send in when you want just to tell you the other one. I have absolutely no problem. We have another frame. When you put 0, 1 here, it's what we call a reject. And reject, at the opposite, it's, I have a problem. So you just say, I have a problem. The sequence I receive is not what I was expecting. So you should have a problem on this. And here is a number I am expecting. So you continue to have the same semantic on NR. And we have a last one, which is called receiver not ready, not ready. So NRR, RNR, sorry. RNR means that 
everything is fine, but I have trouble with my memory. So it means that here, for example, you receive too much information and you are not able to send it on the other, uh, you are able to send it, for example, but you receive too much information. So you know that in the future, you are going to, to lose some frames because you receive more than you can send. So you tell the other guy, stop. Stop sending me information because otherwise I will be in trouble. So we are going to see some, uh, some example of that. So this frame is used for flow control. So here is the three frames you will find in HDLC, and you have another one uh, that is not in lab B, but is, you see, you have one one, and if you have one one, you have what we call a selective, selective reject, selective reject, which means that here when I receive a reject, I have to send everything from the frame that is expected. expected. When I do a selective reject, I just resend the expected frame, and I continue to work uh, on the frame. So we will see some, uh, some examples. So here you see two bits, four frames. We have finished. So here it's a supervision frame, and the last one, the last type of frame you have is start with one one, we have one zero, here one one, so we can make the di uh, difference. And here, I don't have any counter. I have still my PF bit, but the rest is used to carry some specific frame. And for example, here is what we call U frame for unnumbered frames. And I have some message I can use. For example, if I have this value, so I have five bits to number an unnumbered frame. So for example, 11100 means SABM. So SABM is a strange name, means set asynchronous balance mode. So we are going to see what it means in the future. So here, in fact, you can understand that as I want to open a connection. You have this for disconnect. You have uh, UA for unnumbered acknowledgement. For example, these two frames will be uh, will be acknowledged by this uh, UA, and you have a reject here. Uh, the reset frame, but I made a mistake, but it's not so, so important. So, we, we have this frame. And, okay, just one question before we uh, go on the next slide. Here, you have the HDLC frame format. Do you see one missing field? One missing field. Here I have address, control, CRC, but do something is missing. So, for example, length. We have no length. No field that tell me what is the size of this PDU. If you look at some protocol, we have a field that say the length of the PDU. Do we need it here? No. no? Because we have flags. Mm -hmm. So we can measure the length just by looking at the distance between two flags. So length is not here, but it's not a problem. But we have something that is more and more important and we don't have it here. The frame number? No, we have the frame number. The frame number is here. In an S field. 
some reserve. Uh, yes, but it's but the beauty of HDLC is that you can put everything on one byte. So we can have some value here that are not defined, maybe um, this way we can call it reserve bytes, but in fact reserve bytes is I have I don't know what to do with this field, and I put them reserved to maintain the alignment. Here we have not that, that problem. No, length of data is not necessary because I have the length of the PDU. Okay, no. For? Yes, but I know the length of my PDU because it's between flags, and I know that my header is here on two bytes, and my trailer is here on two bytes. So I can find easily. I, su I uh, suppress four bytes, and I have the length of that. <laughs> So what is missing is what I can do with this data. I'm a receiver. I receive this SDU, this part of data, and I have normally to give it to an upper layer entity. And here, nothing here tells me where to which entity I have to give this data. <coughs> So, if we look in the OSI voc vocabulary, I have no SAP information, no service access point information. So I receive this PDU, I have SDU part, service data unit, the equivalent of data, and normally I give this SDU to an entity, an upper layer entity, that will process the information. And normally I should have, I expect in the header, some information that will <laughs> tell me where, which entity has to process the information, this information. And here I don't have it. Because in this example, it was always at layer 3, x25. So I can put only one layer 3, on this layer two. So yeah, no problem. But normally, and we will see that when we'll do the ISDN exercise, we have several kind of layer three protocol, and so we need some way to signal to which layer we have to send the information. To which entity, sorry, in the layer we have to send the information. And normally we will see that, for example, in ISDN network, here on the address, we will continue to have the address because we are in uh, master slave, so we need address. But after that, we will add a sub value that will tell us which layer three entity will process the information. So it means if the the entity which the data is addressed cannot be in the address per se. To be used within it. Here, in that case, no, because the address is also a SAP. Mm -hmm. So if I take uh, OSI vocabulary, an address is a SAP, but the SAP, for example, here will tell me which anti which device on which device I send the information. So here I will address one, two, three, four. So I see if I send something to uh, five, uh, to four. It will be taken into account by this equipment, this piece of equipment that will look at the iframe to see if it's correct or not. And if it's correct, then it will send an indication to an upper layer to say, okay, you have data for you. But here, I have no way to dispatch on different protocol at the upper layer. Because in this, I have no information. So I have to add a field Normally, that tells you on which is 
the layer 3 protocol. And here it's missing for HDLC because HDLC was designed just to carry extensive. Or oh, lab B was designed to do. Okay. So just before the break, how do we open a connection in HDLC? <coughs> it's very easy. I send a message called SABM, set asynchronous balance mode. And SABM, why do we have this? Rem I, you remember, we have different modes. We have the master-slave mode. So here, we can have a master, let's say, to a slave. Do you want to talk? But here, in fact, what we are going to study is communication between two masters. OK? So that's what it's a balance mode. It's a balance mode because there is no master and slave. All devices are at the same level. And it's asynchronous. It's asynchronous because the master can send data when he wants, and the other one can send data when he wants. So in fact, here, we have a dedicated media, two wires, one for transmission and one to receive. No. So it means that here, since you have a dedicated device, give wire, you can send and receive at the same time. You have no risk of collisions. So that's why it's synchronous. So, and what we want is to ask the other guy, okay, you're my equal, and we are going to exchange information when we want. So we send this message, set asynchronous balance. The other one say, okay, or no, if he doesn't want, he will send a disconnect message. But if it's okay, he will send an unnumber acknowledgement. If here, you want to close the connection, then you send a disk message, and the other one will acknowledge. So I take this example, but you can imagine the opposite. The other guy can send a disconnect message, and the other one will acknowledge it. So if there is no relation on the one that send SABM frame and the one that send disconnect frame. So we have this. And the question is, when do we open a connection, and when do we close a connection? And that's something very tricky, because you have a lot of protocol and a lot of layers that are called connection-oriented protocol. So because they have a phase where you open a connection, it means that you allocate resources for, uh, for data, receiving or sending data. Then you have the phase where you send data, and you have the phase where you remove this context and it's a disconnection. But you don't use it the same way at each level. So here, when do I will open my connection? Do you have information to send? No. Here at layer three we will do that. Or with your mobile phone or with your telephone, you will open a connection when you have something to say. Because you use resources on the network, and if you don't use these resources, you want these resources used by someone else. Here, we are on a point-to-point -point link. So I have a dedicated link for my communication. So if I use it or not, I will not bother the rest of the world. But you are always sending flags, right? For example, I can send flags just to synchronize the other. So here, in fact, I will open the connection to say the other guy, I'm ready. You can send me information if you have information. So to know, so here, for example, I will say, OK, my interface is up. 
So I will open the connection to tell the other one my interface is off. And I will shut down my interface. Then I will send a disconnect message to inform the other one that I have shut down my interface. So uh, it's not necessary. If it send me information, I will lose it. So here, in fact, the connection at layer two will last as long as the equipment is active. So it can be days or weeks or months. And if you have nothing to send in the middle, then you just send it. So it's connection oriented, but it's not the way you think it when you think about a telephonic call. Okay? So that's a big difference. 